what's the big deal about posture, right? What, why is it important and why does it matter? So really it comes down to kind of engineering 101. So structure determines function. So some basic examples, of course, we think about like bridge structure. Bridges don't fall because they're designed to have the proper structure. Think about the towers, like you folks work with some of you. Again, you have to have a strong base. The geometry needs to be appropriate so the tower doesn't fall over. Um, when it comes to like bodily movements, think about uh, if you've ever seen photos or videos of our world-class sprinters. So think about their posture. If you've ever seen sprinters warm up, it's amazing. They'll, they'll do jumps and then bring their knees almost up to touch their nose. So think about like the structure of their hip sockets, their spine, and then look what they're able to do, the level of function that they have based upon their structure. Compare that to say someone that has uh, arthritic hips where there's, where there's not good uh, joint motion. And then of course, they're not gonna be able to perform as well. So really when we wanna move better and we wanna take care of our, our body as a whole, uh, posture really, really does matter. So also tightly related is, it's gonna seem like we're taking a little bit of a sidestep, but hang with me, well, it'll tie together in a minute or two, hopefully. So, Think about what your what your body does every second of the day, right? So ever since you've been, the day, the moment you've been born, right? You never have to think about uh, what your heart rate's gonna be. No matter what you decide to eat, you never have to think about, man, how am I gonna digest that meal that I just ate? If you're gonna uh, work late, you never have to calculate what you need to do to compensate for those lost hours of sleep, right? So how does the body do all this? It's all based on the nervous system. So the brain, is the centerpiece of your nervous system. And essentially how your body works is every single second of every single day, there's literally thousands of impulses coming into the brain, telling our brain what is going on with the body. Uh, so that's basically the afferent system. And then your brain needs to decide what needs to be done to keep ourselves in balance. And think of that as uh, how the body communicates to those tissues, cells, glands, it's efferent signals going from the brain through the spinal cord, and then in between each of our vertebrae, we have spinal nerve roots that exit, and then those spinal nerve roots branch countless times to make up the peripheral nervous system. So really, it should be a closed loop. We should be getting constant information in, deciding what needs to be done to stay in balance, and then appropriate signaling out. So this is how it ties in with the spine, right? So proper posture, we know the spine should be tall. It should not be listing or leaning one side to the other. Anytime where we deviate from normal posture, we're gonna be putting stress on those neural structures. And that is a big deal. Current research tells us that pressure on a nerve that's equal to just the weight of a quarter can shut a nervous function down by 60%. So posture really does tie into bodily function. So when you think about posture, your posture is the window to the spine and the nervous system. There was some great research done by yoga practitioners within past eight or nine years where they were able to determine that any time that we deviate from standard neutral position, when we alter our posture, you get measurable biochemical stress to all of our internal organs. And quite interesting is that they were able to show that by improving posture, you could get <clears throat> real world measurable improvements in all of our internal organs. So yes, we don't wanna have repetitive stress strain and, and, and muscle soreness, but think about what really, how your body is affected on the whole by improving our posture. Some other really cool research that came out recently tied in with uh, posture is, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the research on the superhero pose. So essentially just taking a superhero pose, you know, you can actually get changes in hormone function that are pro, um, uh, let's say, tissue anabolism versus cannibalism in terms of breakdown or uh, buildup. So you can get positive hormone change just with assuming postural changes such as like the superhero pose. So, so it's pretty interesting how, how our whole body really is tied together. All right, so that's a little bit on posture. Now when it comes to movements. So when it comes to daily life, uh, for the majority of our 2 million years that we've been on the planet, really it's like our, we can break movements down into uh, ambulation, walking, moving from A to B, and then four major movements. We have push, pull, press, and squat. For most of the time we've been on the planet, we've had to do at least some of those movements on a daily basis. And what happens is when you look at those gross movements, 
you're basically activating your major muscle chains. You're basically moving and lubricating almost all of your major joints. So those movements, not only are they necessary survival, but they really, they promote health within our structures, within our uh, tissues itself. Now the, the opposite side of the macro movements, we have micro movements. So those are like fine motor skills, right? So the trouble is, is that fine motor skills do not promote circulation because they're not moving tissues uh, enough to promote circulation. And then often when it comes to micro movements, we're talking about extremities. And when you look at how uh, our tissues are built, so basically all of our muscles come down to form tendons and the tendons connect to the joints, to the bones to produce the movement. We'll use the wrist as an example because you can really see the tendons quite easily. So the tendons themselves are quite interesting structures. You've got uh, the actual fibrous tendon and then that tendon itself is in a sheath, in a protective sheath, and there's actual lubricating fluid. So when we're doing big gross movements, we're really promoting circulation of that fluid within our structures. The trouble when it comes to micro movements is that we're using those tissues, we're creating a lot of friction, but we're not doing enough movement to actually lubricate. So that's kind of like a, a snapshot of how repetitive stress injuries occur. We're doing micro movements that are not actually advantageous to the tissues, which promotes excessive wear and tear, which promotes inflammation and then eventually tissue damage. So, of course, we've kind of shifted. We don't do the big movements that we used to do on such a regular basis. And now uh, most people know that we're a relatively sedentary society. So the trouble is uh, not only are we not doing as many big macro movements, but we're spending the majority of our day doing uh, micro movements. And that sets us up for uh, a lot of issues. So probably have also heard the terminology that sitting is the new smoking. And many of you heard that. So, and again, that ties in with posture, that ties in with circulation, and it's really amazing. So when you look at all cause mortality, so mortality from all, all forms, chronic disease, it's all cause mortality is increased in sedentary individuals. So when you look at what the research is showing, you, could, you can actually make that argument that sitting can be as destructive as smoking because we're not really nourishing and, and providing the movements that the body needs for optimal health. Uh, and then again, sometimes the trouble that we get into is we make all these modern conveniences that are nice to have, but actually uh, are, are quite bad in, in the long run. One of the, my favorite examples is the modern toilet. So the reality is like 80% of the world still does a full squat whenever they need to do their business. So just watch like when you drop into a full squat, that's a massive amount of flexion at the hip. You need a lot of spinal stabilizers. You need ankle mobility. So another kind of interesting drill is if you go to the any airport or grocery store and and kind of keep an eye on, let's say, anyone that you that you can guess is let's say 70 years and older and watch how they move and then compare and contrast that with any National Geographic footage of primitive cultures and you see how, how different people move when they're forced to uh, not have all of these modern conveniences. All right, so how do, we, how do we fix things? How do we improve things? So essentially we wanna improve our posture, we wanna improve our ergonomics, and of course we wanna move better, we wanna stretch, and we wanna exercise and hydrate, which are all, all kind of tied in with uh, the bigger picture. So let's just go over a couple things ergonomic wise, really important in this environment. So roughly the, the major thing you gotta remember is like the 90 degree rule. So when you sit, Essentially, your hip angle should be at about 90 degrees. Knee angle should be at about 90 degrees as well. And I'm going to back up for a minute. It's up without a wall, but essentially what our standing posture should look like is if I had a wall here, heels should hit the wall, buttocks should hit the wall, back of the head rocks should hit the wall. Not just your upper back, but the glenohumeral joints, your upper arms should hit as well too. So that's like a good check-in. If you ever want to see how far off you are or how well you're doing, just check in with the wall. And when you're standing like that, you'll, you'll feel that you should feel relatively balanced. For some people, it might be hard to get to that position, but that tells us where we need to work. 
And essentially those rules you kind of want to apply when you sit. So when you want to sit, we want to continue to have that spine up. And then ideal position like typing wise, mouse work wise, is imagine those shoulders hitting the wall and then just bending those elbows now to about 90 degrees. So this is roughly where we want to be. That's why uh, like the split keyboards that came into fashion a number of years ago, those were designed to, to try to avoid this so we can get a little bit more ergonomically correct as far as that goes. A um, couple really simple tips, but super important for monitor position because that plays a big role in your neck. When your head is in the ideal neutral position, your gaze, your eye gaze drops about 15 degrees. So what that means is when it comes to placing your monitor, a lot of times we think we want that monitor to be right at eye height, but because of that gaze drop, you're gonna actually start turtling your neck down and then up, and that's abnormal. So ideal monitor position is the top of the monitor itself should be right at eye level. So that way, when the gaze drops your 15 degrees, you should be landing at a pretty good location of the screen. And then how far away the screen, um, sometimes vision, vision changes can alter this, but roughly when we have that starting neutral position, we put your arm up at about where your arm lands should be about where the monitor should be. So those are a couple of little simple things. Think about the 90 degree rule, monitor height, monitor distance, and that can really help to kind of set you up for uh, success as far as that goes. It gets difficult for a lot of us to work on laptops because how can you do that? So that's why I think about like a docking station, uh, paying the butt to have that extra stuff there, but it's important your tissue, so thank you. All right, so I'm gonna give a brief overview on ideal exercise outside of office and then we'll start working inside. So, you know, how do we combat this sedentary nature? Do we need to do hours of work in the gym? And again, the research here says no, so less is better. So that's, that's a good thing here. How many are familiar with uh, the term high intensity interval training or HIIT training? A few folks, okay, cool. So essentially, I'm gonna give you an example of what like a basic HIIT intensity workout is. The nice thing is the research shows, again, we don't have to spend much time at all. So once we know that our heart and ticker is ready to go, an example of what a uh, high interval training session is this. Let's say you go to the gym and you're gonna be on like the bike or treadmill or elliptical for that matter. You do like a five or 10 minute warm up, nice couple of pace just to get your tissues warmed up. And then it's as simple as you do a minute where you ramp up the intensity where you're going as hard as you can, but you're not gonna keel over. Of course, you go one minute hard, hard, hard. And then after that minute, you drop it back for another minute. And then after that minute of dropping it back, typically what happens is you'll have your breath back. You don't feel like 100% back, but you're starting to recover. And then bam, you do it again. Minute on, minute low key. So the studies show all you need to do is six to eight reps of that. And essentially what you're doing is kind of like revving the engine. So what you're doing is you're forcing your body to say, hey, let's keep these tissues, let's keep the circulatory system going, but you're not pushing yourself to like extremes. Uh, again, as a chocolate, I love doing the long stuff, but it's not actually necessarily the best thing to do. So you don't have to go long to actually get the most bang for the buck. And then when it comes to movement work or strength work, we do need that because again, we're designed, we really evolved to do those push, pull, press squats. So those are the four basic things we need to do. So you don't have to spend lots of money on, on equipment or fancy gyms. And essentially when it comes to those type of movements, uh, we're talking four to six reps of heavy weight where when you finish like five, six rep, you're, you're tired, like you can't push too much more. And then you take a couple of minutes to really recover. And then again, three or four sets of that four to six reps, where again, you're really just challenging yourself, but you're not overdoing it. So when you look at the high intensity, if you were to do that two or three days a week and two or three days a week of strength, you can really help to mitigate a lot of the uh, downside of not doing those things on a regular basis. All right, so now let's talk about in-office work. So who here is familiar with the Pomodoro technique? Anyone? So a ton of research that came out and it's been uh, a lot of like uh, Fortune 500 companies utilize this type of uh, workplace productivity scheme. So essentially what it means is about every 20 to 25 minutes, when you take a break from what you're doing and shake out, studies show that you can actually concentrate better and, and do better work. So that's been tried and true and it's been repeated in a number of studies. So why not dovetail the shakeout with a few of the stretches? So 
that's kind of a perfect time frame to think about how often we need to stretch. And this can be hard because when you're working on something that's, that you're really into, I know how hours can go by. And the next thing you know, we've just done like a massive block of repetitive stress to our tissues without any anything to kind of, again, mitigate those stress stresses. So think about, we do this every 20, 25 minutes, maybe every 30 minutes, set a little timer. And as you'll see, these things don't take uh, a lot of time. So we need shoes off for this one. So kick out your shoes off, everyone. So remember, structure determines function. So we always want to work from the base and work up. Most of us spend all day in shoes. We don't activate our, do we have any air spray around here? <laughs> but many of us don't activate the intrinsic musculature of the feet. Uh, research shows that almost all of us, 90 plus percent of us have some degree of flat feet or excessive pronation as we call it. So what happens is when we walk, we're supposed to land on the outer third of the foot. We should have a little bit of shock absorption and then we should be pushing right off the great toe. But myself included, most of us, when we put full weight on our feet, we actually collapse in. When you collapse in, we're gonna to exaggerate to a high arch and then a very flat arch. Watch the knee here. You see the knee go this way? Can you see that? So again, the knee is a hinge joint. So the worst possible thing you can do for a hinge joint is to twist it. So a lot of us uh, beat our knees and hips up every day because we're pronating. Uh, and then that actually puts a lot of low back stress. Uh, we'll just touch upon one muscle. There's a muscle called your piriformis. It goes from your sacrum out to your hip. So when your hip corkscrews inward, you're gonna pull on piriformis, which literally takes and does a low back shift. And again, that spine should be nice and level. So anytime that you force it to go side to side, you're gonna be creating a lot of low back stress. So simple exercise is called the short foot. And this is good just to wake the feet up. So what happens is, here's the flat foot, right? We're essentially gonna be squeezing the carpet. And when we squeeze the carpet, you're gonna see the arch is gonna rise. Okay, so flat, and now I'm gonna squeeze the carpet. You see the arch rise and then rest. You see that everyone over there? So again, squeeze. Now what you don't want to do is we don't curl our toes up like this. The toes stay flat, but you're doing that same motion. All right, cool. Can everyone feel that? So super simple, but think about it. How many times do we go probably weeks without actually activating the intrinsic musculature of the feet? So this is very important. So again, all you need to do is just stand up, squeeze and rest. And you just do 10 reps of that or so just to wake those feet up. Seems a little, seems a little uh, like a small little thing that can have a big impact. I'm gonna take one little side, side journey here. For those of you that do work out, and you know, again, we all should be doing some sort of uh, working out. Whenever you're doing anything at the gym, it's always help, help, very helpful to do at least a few reps barefoot. But again, you wanna make sure you're not damaging your knee while you're doing that. So. A simple thing to do is just some basic squats with the short foot activation. So essentially squeeze, get those arches up and then go through some squat positions and try not to lose those elevated arches. So that's something simple that you can do on your own as well too. And that can <laughs> crunch. <laughs> and then that's really important because the more that you practice this, you want to start engaging those muscles on a regular basis. So if you do this for a long enough period of time, over a few months, you'll start activating those tissues more normally when you're walking. And not only will that help to protect your spine, your hips and your knees, uh, but that actually helps improve performance uh, massively. So that's the short foot exercise. All right, uh, next one we're gonna do is Talking about how shaking out the hands, we know that pretty much probably all of us here do too much repetitive stress to the wrist. So the most simple, best stretch is this. You wanna take your fingers, and the first rule is stretch your arm all the way out. Then gently pull back until you feel a comfortable stretch. And then the key is you have, really have to hold this for you know at least 30 seconds. Because remember, we've done a million micro movements so we wanna really pull those tendons through the sheath. 
circulate some of that natural lubricating fluid. And then the other side. And you'll notice that if you do that without stretching the elbow, like I feel that in the wrist, but I don't feel anything towards the elbow. So when you go full out, you should feel a much deeper stretch, not only in the wrist, but you should start to feel some pull down in the elbow. And after you hold that for about 30 seconds, gently shake it out. And then you want to work flexion. And then for flexion, we can just do both of them together, palms together, and then just slowly drop down until you feel a little bit of a stretch. And then same thing, hold it for like 30 seconds. We're supposed to be feeling stretch and shake it out. Uh, that one's odd. Sometimes you just feel it in the wrist. You won't usually feel too much. So here really it's just a matter of trying to pull those tendons through the sleeves in both, both directions. You won't typically feel too much there. And then shake it out. All right, so let's see. This one, oh, good. So now we got to work on the neck a little bit. So simple one here is you grab one side of the chair and then you tilt your head to the opposite side and then gently take this hand and just give a little stretch. You should never feel sharp pain. Just a little dull stretch, maybe, maybe a little ache, but a stretch is what we're looking for. And then same thing, good 30 seconds. You can go a little bit longer here, 30 seconds to a minute, and then very gently come off. Grab the other side of the chair, tilt away, and then straight over, just gentle pressure. And that's a good time to check in to see, okay, am I like this or where am I? So really simple work to do there. All right, now, actually, you do the seated or standing. Again, almost all of us suffer from forward head carriage. The chin tends to follow what the shoulders do. Again, I know I set, I try to set my station up like this, and after like 15 or 20 minutes, no doubt everything migrates. And then if I took a snapshot of the neck, you know, I'm probably here versus like where it's supposed to be here. So we need to do something to kind of mirror image. If we're here all day, you know, and we should be here, we need to do some sort of reverse to try to balance out. So simple chin tuck. So for the chin tucks, the goal is you can just put a little bit of pressure on your chin and you want to go straight back like a turtle. And then hold, one, two, three, and then relax. Straight back. Sometimes what you'll notice is if you're stiff, people will do this. It's like, no, we don't want to pin it up. We want to stretch straight back and get these upper cervicals that are almost chronically tight in all of us. And these upper cervical muscles, by the way, they have common innervation or wiring patterns in the brain, the same region that regulates face and head pain. So when we're tight and dysfunctional there, people that have headaches, uh, almost all of the time, there's some complicating factors in the upper cervical spine. So this is very good to stretch those little tiny muscles that are just on fire all day long. So chin tucks. All right, now we're gonna get a little more full body here. So this one looks a little more crazy, but it's actually really good. So we're gonna start with that short foot, but we're gonna incorporate that in a total body stretch. So this is like one of my favorite, like Tai Chi good morning stretches. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off exaggerating the flat foot, the bad position with internally rotated knees. And so we're going to kind of like start with everything bad. And then as we breathe in, we're going to fix everything and open up. So what it looks like is we slump forward with that bad posture. And then when I take a breath in, I'm going to slowly start to stand up. And when I start to stand up, you want to start squeezing the ground. And then literally we bring our arms up and then back and then relax with a big deep breath. A lot of times when you do that, you'll hear some clicking and some <laughs> crunching and joints are like what i had to move for how long so doing two or three of these every 30 minutes can be pretty awesome so again we slump forward feet rolled in and relax and then people say what the heck is going on here but that's another really good stretch to kind of open things up <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a good overview of like some things that you can do every 20, 30 minutes. Again, if you were to just run through what we did, it would probably take like a couple minutes, no more than that. Now, this is something that you can, it's important to do uh, maybe once or twice a day. So we're going to go over uh, a door jam pack stretch, although 
Oh, there we go. Okay. So essentially, again, if we're like this a lot, you want to try to mirror image, right? So. <laughs> So, so essentially, what we want to do is, if it's a normal door, we can have arms up like this, and then you glide forward until you start to feel the stretch. And then hold this for like 30 seconds, a minute if you can. Now, some people with shoulder injuries, that won't feel good. Again, you should never have sharp pain. If you're getting any just bad feeling in that shoulder, you can drop the hands down, and then typically you have to glide forward a little bit more and then once you feel that stretch again, hold that for really a good minute or more if you can. And that's really important because, again, we just spend too much time internally rotating. So getting those shoulders back, not only is it good for chest, upper back, and shoulders, but you'll actually improve your breath as well, too. So that's a favorite. <laughs> All right, now, the gym ball. So essentially, uh, again, we just want to get mobility in the spine. We just spend too many hours fixated. So we just mold, we lie on the ball forward, we lie on the ball backwards, and we just want to try to create some movement, lubricate the spine. So again, just face forward, you can roll forward and backwards. And sometimes you might feel a little stretch when you go a little bit lower. When you roll up, I might feel a little bit more of my upper back. We can literally just spend 30 seconds or so kind of mold, basically it's called spinal molding. So you just mold yourself to the wall. And the opposite, it's kind of like the door jam on steroids. You can kind of roll back and forth. And again, there you feel good opening. You can move back and forth, so you add a little bit of movement too. Um, don't roll into any hard objects, of course. Watch out for sharp furniture. <laughs> um, all right, and now we're gonna get a little bit more active. Volunteer Heidi. Sure. All right. So, Volunteer Heidi. So you can just like you can have these at home. You can throw this around uh, a door handle, um, a solid piece of furniture that won't move. Your wife. So your wife that works well is here. So the goal is again it's mirror imaging. So what I want to do is we want to really keep the arms straight, and it's all about getting the shoulder blades back. So to do that, you pretend like you have a, uh, a walnut right between your shoulder blades and you want to squeeze it. So a lot of times people just do this. You can see that I can keep my shoulders all rolled forward and do this. And that's not really helping improve my posture. So that's why we really want to do this by getting the shoulders right back and then squeezing for three, four, eight seconds and then down and then back. And after you have that movement down where you know that you're getting good scapular retraction as we say, then you can bend the elbows to get a little bit more, but just it's just key to make sure you start with this first. That way we know we're not missing the most important movement. And then you can always bring back. So in that, you can do a couple sets of 15 to 20 reps. Again, here it's really mobilizing. We're not going for like building big strength. We want to kind of get those shoulders back. So very, very simple. All right, so pop quiz. What is the window to the nervous system and the spine? There will be a giveaway for whoever answers this correctly. Okay. Now, what is the window to your nervous system? If you want to know how your, if you want to get a sneak peek of how your nervous system and your spine is doing, what do you look at? Awesome. Yes, there you go. All right. Gym ball. Go. <laughs> All right. Richard Evans. <laughs> now, let's touch on hydration for a minute. <clears throat> because 80% of our tissues are water, and most of us are chronically dehydrated. So, all the athletes that I work with, that's one of the hardest things that we deal with is trying to get hydration status up. Um, when you work it in in an office, this temperature control, um, low humidity, we can become dehydrated pretty pretty easily. So a couple rules of thumb. Number one, if you wait until you're thirsty to drink, clinically, you're already dehydrated from an optimal function point of view. When it comes to hydration, so 
coffee, tea, those things don't count, even though they have a higher water content. The fact that your body still has to filter the other constituents that come in along with those water molecules. Uh, now, on the plus side, coffee doesn't quite dehydrate us like they used to say it did. So even in the athletic community, there was, there was a chunk of time where they said, no, no, no coffee's bad, it's just dehydrate. It doesn't really dehydrate that much, but it doesn't hydrate us. So how much water should we be drinking? Rough rule of thumb here is take your body weight, cut it in half, and, that, and then turn that into ounces, and that's about what you should strive for. Now, the other side of the coin here is that that's a lot of water. So when we do sweat, we lose minerals. So what are we doing to get our minerals back? So a good rule of thumb here is that for one or two of those good sized cups per water per day, get some like good quality, natural, like Himalayan salt. It's got all the different color. Those are trace minerals that are really important in addition to the salts. So doing a good pinch of Himalayan salt in the water uh, once or twice per day can make sure that you're not depleting yourself of the minerals as you push that hydration in. And that's very important with repetitive stress injuries because any tendinopathy or tendonitis almost always has a component of dehydration. Because again, remember those tendons glide through a tendon sleeve that need lubrication. And when you're dehydrated, you're not, those, those fluids aren't doing what they're supposed to. So a lot of times like, what's the big deal of drinking water? But it plays a huge role with repetitive stress. And when you look at the uh, workers' comp data, it's a huge role of uh, proper hydration plays. All right, so let's see here. This is a quick one. What, what do you add to your water? Oh, oh man. I think Nicole said it first. Nicole? Oh. <laughs> There's the exercise band. Uh, how much water should you drink per day? Half your body weight. Right. Oh. Now, this little gadget. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. So oh my this is a gyroscope. Oh you guys should have one at the office. So basically what you do is you wind it up and then you grab it tight and you let it go and then you you make circles with it. And as you make circles, you'll hear it start winding faster and faster. It can get up to like 10,000 RPM. So that is a really good way to force good movement of your all of your flexors and extensors in the forearms. Um, and we've had lots of folks with uh, acute injuries to wrist tendinitis that have cleared up just by using this tool. All right, now, all right, let's see. Another fun tool to use. Have any of you seen the TheraBand bar before? So again, this is pretty simple. What you do is you, you wind it up and then you pick a wrist to slowly unwind it. So essentially what you're doing is you're doing, you're putting a force in the muscle as you're lengthening the muscle. And again, that's something that uh, has been clinically shown to help prevent tendonitis issues. And those that have tendonitis is one of the key steps to uh, for rehabilitation of, of those injuries. So these things are awesome. You can, no, you shouldn't hit your coworker with these. <laughs> they have some good weight in the jar. Okay. Um, all right. And then, how about one final giveaway here? How often should we stretch? Can we look at five minutes? I think that's Chris. Chris? All right. I'm just <laughs> So, Kelly Starrett, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He's a physical therapist who is prolific in the content uh, in, the, in, in producing content. He was one of the first crossfitters. So this book is amazing. If you want more references about other things to do to mitigate the stress of uh, sitting, he's the man. So there you are. There's lots of pictures in there? Yeah, there's pictures in there. He has unlimited like, uh, videos too on how to do a lot of the things that he talks about. What's that? He has a book? He has videos. <laughs> All right, that's a nutshell. Any any questions? When you're doing all the stretches, so you generally do like flat foot thing, typing. Anything standing, you might as well. Yeah. yeah, just to make sure that you know, you know, as you start getting used to it, you, you'll be able to activate those without having to do so much conscious effort. Um, but then again, and then for those of you that train, anything, anytime you can do, uh, like one of the other best combination moves are like single leg deadlifts with like a kettlebell. 
you do those where you activate the foot and then you drop down for the kettlebell. You come up and do reps there. And then that's, that is so important um, because essentially when you start activating your feet, the intrinsic foot musculature is part of the posterior chain. Your boots are part of the posterior chain when it comes to running, when it comes to jumping, when it comes to almost any athletic endeavor. We need good, strong glutes. And the long story short is all major muscles are set up where we have two muscles that oppose one another <clears throat> and bicep, tricep, right? So when you contract your bicep, neurologically, you shut your tricep off completely. And if you didn't do that, we'd be fighting ourselves with every single movement that we do. So the trouble with the modern work environment is that when you sit, what are we shortening? Our hip flexors. What's the opposite muscle group of hip flexors? Your glutes. So when it comes to running, uh, when it comes to athletes, we see so many knee injuries, hip injuries, um, and it probably nine out of 10 runners that I work with that have injuries, their glutes are just shut off because their hip flexors are so, so uh, chronically tight. So long story short is you got stress hip flexors, then you have to practice how do you activate those glutes and it all starts with the feet. So that's why the more that you can practice doing that, you're gonna start waking up the neural pathways that drive your glutes, so. If you have a flat arch doing this, will actually help it? Well, you're, you'll probably still need support of some sort just because uh, it, it would take a lot of programming and balance coordinated work to really overcome the subconscious uh, degree that you let those feet be flat for such a long time. Uh, it could theoretically, it could help. Supposedly, there are some cases out there where that's been resolved, but I really haven't seen it. Well, if you have the super feet too, you can tell people. That yeah, super, like super feet is an off the shelf insert. It does a very good job of giving most people just enough correction so that their mechanics are better, uh, but they're not expensive and they're not hard to get used to. A lot of times if you get inserts made by like podiatrists, they're hard, they're rigid, they're tough to get used to, and sometimes they can overcorrect. Uh, so super feet like is one good example of an insert we use like all the time. And I probably have to cast custom orthotics like one out of 50 because companies like Superfeet are doing such a good job.